it should come as no surprise that we find no clear error in its ultimate conclusion that FIU failed to establish a likelihood of confusion. Potential college students are relatively sophisticated consumers who are unlikely to be easily or meaningfully confused by similar sounding university names. This is a community supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So this is in the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. These are two Florida universities who are suing each other, or, or rather, I believe it's uh, one of them is, is trying to invalidate the trademark of the other, and we'll see which one's which. And this is Florida International University versus Florida National University. Well, Can you see the trademark issue here? <laughs> now, the question is going to become whether the trademark really does have the protection that they think it does. At issue in this trademark case is whether Florida National University infringed the trademark rights of Florida International University in its registered trademark, Florida International University. So we're going to call these guys FNU and FIU, or committed unfair competition when changing their name from Florida National College to Florida National University. After thorough review, and with the benefit of oral argument, we affirm the district court's entry of final judgment in favor of Florida National University on all claims. Florida National University is the defendant. So <laughs> maybe we could put that up on the screen there, that FIU is the plaintiff and FNU is the, is the defendant. That's going to be tough to keep track of. Founded by the Florida legislature in 1965, FIU plaintiff is a public body corporate of the state of Florida and part of Florida's state university system. FIU has two major campuses in South Florida, a 342-acre Modesto A. Medique campus in West Miami-Dade County, which features student residences, eight-story library, nature preserve, athletic stadium, art museum. FIU is South Florida's only public research university offering 180 bachelor's, master's, doctoral degree programs, as well as a variety of non-degree and certificate programs. FIU owns a word trademark for its name, Florida International University and three design trademarks. It has spent substantial resources, time, and effort promoting its brand, etc. FNU Defendant is a for-profit private higher education institution headquartered in Hialeah, Florida, or Hialeah, Florida, founded in 1987, initially operated under the name Florida International Institute. At its inception, FNU, operating as FII, was accredited to grant associate's degrees as its highest level offering. In December 1987, it changed its name to the Florida International College in order to reflect the credentials of additional programs it was offering. In 1989, FIU objected to FNU's name change. The lawsuit was settled when FIU and FNU stipulated that FNU would change its name from Florida International College to Florida National College. From 1989 to 2012, FIU and FNU coexisted very peacefully without any confusion caused by FNU's use of the name Florida National College. While operating as Florida National College, Florida National University obtained several federal and Florida trademarks relating to that name. In 2008, FNU, still operating under the name Florida National College, became accredited to offer bachelor's level degree programs. And in December 2011, it became accredited to offer a master's degree in business administration. It officially changed its name March 4, 2020 12 to Florida National University because a college doesn't offer the higher level degree programs. Now operating under that name, FNU offers one master's degree, seven bachelor's degree, 22 associate's degrees, nine diploma programs, and nine certificate programs. 2,800 students are enrolled. Nearly half were associates of science or arts. 20 were in English as a second language. 15% were bachelor's and 1% were pursuing a, ma a master's degree. FNU currently operates two campuses, does not offer on-campus housing, etc. June 26, 2012, FNU filed a federal trademark application for the word Florida National University and this design mark FIU opposes. FNU has successfully registered the same trademarks with the Florida Department of State Division of Corporations. FNU uses the name Florida National University and corresponding logo to advertise and promote its educational services. It has used and promoted the Florida National part of its full name since at least 1989 and considers the Florida National brand to represent one of its most important assets. 
On May 3rd, 2013, FIU commenced this lawsuit in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida against FNU for infringements of trademarks and related violations. The circumstances surrounding the ensuing procedural history are essential to understand the resolution of this lawsuit. November 4th, 2014, the district court held a status conference in anticipation of commencing a bench trial December 1st. At the conference, the court directly asked the parties whether they had any additional evidence to present at trial that was not already covered in the many submissions they had made to the court. In other words, was there already enough stuff on record? FNU's counsel answered that in light of the comprehensive submissions of the parties, the court could resolve many of the issues issues in the case on summary judgment and could greatly narrow the issues that would be litigated at trial, FIU's counsel took this plan a substantial step further, telling the district court that the party's evidentiary submissions and accompanying briefing would allow the court to make the same decision it ultimately could make if the parties marched in all the fact and expert witnesses and put them on the stand, and thus the court would not learn anything new at trial that it had not already seen from both sides. He further explained that there are enough undisputed facts that the court has a record from which it could make a summary judgment decision that is in essence going to be a bench trial decision. A summary judgment decision that's in essence a bench trial decision. Okay. FIU's counsel agreed with the approach suggested by FNU's counsel, where the parties could come in and present the court in the form of either a closing or summary judgment argument, which would hopefully expedite and consolidate everything. The district court agreed to conduct a hearing, at which time the parties could sum up their pleadings instead of scheduling a bench trial during which the parties would present live evidence. But the court acknowledged that if, after the hearing, it was determined that there was a genuine issue of fact, that's the summary judgment standard, that needed to be fleshed out for trial, it might ask the parties to present additional evidence. On December 3rd, 2014, the court heard oral argument in the court's words on cross motions for summary judgment slash bench trial. The court is not helping things with this confusion. At the conclusion of the hearing, the court said that it understood the party's views of the record and it did not see any need for live testimony unless either party felt that it would add to or continue this proceeding. FIU's counsel agreed with the district court and FNU's counsel said that he too would not be adding anything to the record. The trial court then addressed each of FIU's six claims just as it would have done after a bench trial, granting judgment in favor of FNU on each one. The district court found that FIU had failed to establish that FNU's marks created a likelihood of confusion with FIU's marks. At the outset, it is critical that we decide what we are reviewing today, a summary judgment order or a final judgment entered after a bench trial. In the unique circumstances of this case, we think the district court's decision is better understood as a judgment entered after a bench trial. So that's how they're gonna proceed. And then we get to the trademark standard because I know, I know you don't wanna hear all the procedure. If you wanted to hear that, you could go read it for yourself. Here, we're gonna get straight to the meat of the matter or uh, veggies if you're a vegetarian. Um, we're gonna get right to the heart of the matter, which I guess that's also meat, that doesn't help. Under the Lanham Act, defendant is liable for trademark infringement if, without consent, he uses in commerce any reproduction, counterfeit, copy, or colorable imitation of a registered mark that is likely to cause confusion or cause mistake or to deceive. Our case law makes clear that in order to prevail on a federal trademark infringement claim, FIU has to demonstrate one, it has marks that have priority over FNU's marks that FNU's marks were likely to cause consumer confusion. The parties agree that FIU's marks have priority over FNU's marks, so we need only ask whether the district court clearly erred in finding that FIU failed to establish that FNU created a likelihood of confusion. We consider seven factors. Remember, there are there were eight in the other, in the California district, but there's seven here. Likelihood of confusion factors. One, the strength of the allegedly infringing mark, the similarity of the marks, the similarity of the goods and services, the similarity of the trade channels, the similarity of advertising media, the intent of the alleged infringer to misappropriate the proprietor's goodwill, the existence and extent of actual confusion in the consuming public. Of these factors, the type of the mark and evidence of actual confusion are the most important. Notably, we review the district court's findings as to each factor for clear error. So this is not a brand new review. We often say de novo or brand new, and this is not a brand new review. This is only clear error. So they're using a standard that a district court's error in its analysis of one of the subsidiary factors in the likelihood of confusion test, which we just read above, any error is not enough to allow us to overturn the district court's decision. Rather, we must be convinced that the district court's ultimate conclusion is clearly erroneous. 
So they get to do the analysis themselves and they have to decide whether the district court's conclusion is clearly uh, in error. Not any one factor, but the whole thing. In analyzing likelihood of confusion, we are also mindful that sophisticated consumers of complex goods or services are less likely to be confused than casual purchasers of small items. Importantly, the district court recognized that students looking for a college to attend are likely to be relatively sophisticated and knowledgeable because of the nature, importance, and size of the investment in a college education. As one court has observed, it is hard to imagine a more important or expensive purchase than a college education. The degree of care and thought involved in choosing a college is undoubtedly higher than that required for most purchases. In its complaint, FIU claimed that four of its trademarks were violated by FNU's name change, but on appeal, FIU argues only that FNU's use of its new name and acronym are likely to cause confusion. FIU has thus abandoned any claim to its design marks, which bear no resemblance to each other anyway. Accordingly, we analyze only whether FNU's use of its new name and acronym is likely to cause confusion with FIU's word mark and acronym. On the first factor, the allegedly infringing mark's strength is the second most important factor. The stronger the mark, the greater the scope of protection. Our case law instructs us that a fact finder, like a jury, should assess the strength of the mark in two ways. First, it clarifies the mark as generic, descriptive, suggestive, or arbitrary based on the relationship between the mark and the service or good it describes. Generic marks are weakest and not entitled to protection. They refer to a class of which an individual or product is a member. Descriptive marks describe a characteristic or quality of an article or service. Suggestive marks suggest characteristics of the good or service and require imaginative effort by the consumer in order to be understood as descriptive. Finally, arbitrary marks, the strongest of the four categories bear no relationship to the product. Not surprisingly, then, arbitrary marks are strongest. After categorizing the nature of the mark, the fact finder considers the degree to which third parties make use of the mark. The less that third parties use the mark, the stronger it is and the more protection it deserves. A mark's strength is enhanced if it has incontestable status. A mark is incontestable if it has been registered for five years and the holder has filed an affidavit as required by the law. In this case, the parties agree that FIU's mark is incontestable, but in light of its incontestable status, the court appropriately presumed that the mark was relatively strong, but determined that FNU had rebutted the presumption of strength by showing extensive third-party use of the mark, explaining that FNU had identified 13 other entities using the terms Florida and University, all of which are aimed at the same education marketplace as FIU. Thus, the district court adjudged Florida International University to be relatively weak. In this case, the district court reasonably found as a fact that extensive third-party use diminished the strength of FIU's wordmark and acronym. Excluding FIU and FNU, 12 other higher education institutions in the state of Florida use both Florida and University in their names. And they list them out here. Florida a &M, Florida Atlantic, Florida Christian, Florida Gulf Coast, etc., etc., etc. 11 of these 12 universities are members of Florida's state university system, like FIU. 12 third-party uses can be sufficient to diminish the distinctiveness of a mark. Considering the frequency of third-party use and in context, it seems to us that FIU operates in a crowded field of similar names. Accordingly, the district court's conclusion was reasonable. And then they conclude, on the strength of the mark, we can discern no clearer error in the district court's finding that FIU's word mark is relatively weak. However, relatively weak marks are still entitled to a narrow range of protection. Therefore, we are also obliged to examine the other six factors. And they go on to similarity of the marks. We remain unpersuaded. For starters, the parties stipulated that Merriam-Webster's online dictionary classifies international as a near antonym of national. The district court reasonably attributed more weight to the meanings than to the appearance and sound of the marks, especially in a field where so many competitors have names that appear and sound similar. Moreover, in a crowded field of similar acronyms, the district court reasonably found that the addition of one more school identifying itself with an acronym containing the letters F and U 
would not materially add to the confusion. This is especially true in a field like post-secondary education where the primary consumers, potential students, and their parents generally spend a substantial amount of time and energy learning about their options before choosing a school and are, therefore, unlikely to be confused by similar names. We can find no clear error in the district court's determination that the names and acronyms were not confusingly similar. On the similarity of the products, the parties agree that this factor weighs in favor of plaintiff FIU, so we accept the district court's determination. On the similarity of retail outlets and customers, it seems plain to us that there simply isn't much of an overlap between the two schools' potential bodies. We see little resemblance in the retail outlets of the two schools, the campuses and the websites where students can take classes, and therefore they find no clear error. And if you want to know what's in these paragraphs, because we kind of skipped them, it, it, they mostly go over that the students are two different types of students with two different uh, makeups of student bodies, and so two different markets, basically, that they serve. Similarity of advertising media, the district court found there was minimal overlap in the audience of the two schools advertising. FNU's intent, the district court found that FNU's prior knowledge of FIU's mark was insufficient to create an inference of improper intent and that prior litigation relating to the name was not persuasive evidence of an improper intent. Accordingly, the court found that the intent factor weighed against finding a likelihood of confusion. There, it seems like there wasn't enough evidence presented by FIU. On the actual confusion issue, evidence of confusion by actual or potential customers is, of course, the best evidence of a likelihood of confusion. The parties stipulated that there has never been a single known instance during the application process where a prospective student has applied for admission to either FNU or FIU under the impression that FNU was associated with FIU. However, FIU produced evidence of two instances of alleged actual customer confusion. A July 7th, 2014 email from a FedEx employee to an FIU administrator asking whether FNU is accredited with FIU and a May 28, 2014 letter sent to FNU from a California high school student who requested information regarding admission to and programs at FIU because she was investigating the various colleges and universities she was considering attending as part of a sophomore class project. FIU provided hearsay testimony and submitted evidence that a radio announcer was reading an FNU advertisement and said, Florida, enter... I mean Florida National University. The district court determined that the FedEx employee's email was entitled to little weight because it was unclear whether she was an actual customer. It found the high school student's letter merited greater consideration because she was a potential applicant, but determined that a sole minimal instance, they use de minimis here, I love that phrase, a de minimis instance of consumer confusion is not enough to militate in favor of a finding of likelihood of confusion. The court did not credit FIU's hearsay evidence. It concluded that FIU had provided insufficient evidence in favor of likelihood of confusion. With only a single probative instance of consumer confusion, the district court reasonably decided that this factor did not weigh in favor of a likelihood of confusion. Having found the district court's assessment of each of the seven likelihood of confusion factors to be reasonable, it should come as no surprise that we find no clear error in its ultimate conclusion that FIU failed to establish a likelihood of confusion. Three of the seven factors, similarity of services, overlap in customers and trade channels, and similarity in advertising methods weigh slightly in favor of finding a likelihood of confusion, but the two most important factors, evidence of actual confusion and strength of the mark, do not. Moreover, FIU's burden of establishing a likelihood of confusion was higher than usual in this case because, we repeat, potential college students are relatively sophisticated consumers who are unlikely to be easily or meaningfully confused by similar sounding university names. Considering these factors in concert, the district court reasonably concluded that FNU's adoption of its new name and acronym did not and would not likely cause consumer confusion. We therefore affirm the court's denial of FIU's federal trademark claim. And there's other claims in there, but we're not going to go over them because it's another several pages long. So interesting that that is how that played out. I, I don't necessarily know that I had an opinion on it before, but I see where the court went and I agree with the court. Uh, I, I don't I think that's an easy cop out for me, though. What do you think? Let us know.
That is our show, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me today. We will produce these videos into the stories that will drop on YouTube this week. We thank you very much for your support because YouTube has a, 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 a habit of regularly demonetizing our videos and it has cut our production profits by a lot, by over two thirds. And we now have uh, tactical on staff helping us on the law side and occasionally helping us on the YouTube side. And Brandon is on Lawful Mass's staff. Uh, he gets paid for editing the videos. And so we have financial obligations every month. Our legal news service that allows us to access these stories and, and documents and things easily is $1,200 a year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have some expenses on our end and YouTube keeps messing with the demonetization. For example, the Joey Johnson story, we put out two videos one is just an extended version of the other. The extended version is fully monetized and confirmed. The shorter version is fully demonetized and confirmed. That makes no sense. They're both the exact same video. One is just longer. So that makes no sense. Anyway, so support us on sponsus.org slash law or patreon.com slash LJ French. Thank you very much to our supporters in the month of July. We have a $500 supporter this month, Joshua Davis from Tandape. We're gonna be doing a video about his social insurance program. It's really interesting. It's based on blockchain technology and it's really, really interesting. And we're going to try and figure out if there's a way we can get this idea to stick in people's heads. Thank you also to the $50 plus supporters, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negray, Daniel Perez, and Snorri Wazatsky. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are also scrolling on the LED panel above me. And all of you will be in the description of the videos below. I am Leonard French. I am your favorite copyright attorney, and I We'll leave some some uh, room here for super slow mo dog video uh, and other, any other dog video that we've got here because we we shot I don't know an hour's worth of of dog pool party video between regular slow mo like 60 frames per second and then slowing that down and then we did some uh, 1080p uh, I think it was 480 frames per second or 240 frames per second super slow mo and then slowed that down to its uh, 60 frames per second equivalent and made a whole video for you and we're gonna drop part parts of that in the various videos. I think I even dropped the, some of that today in the video I dropped this morning. Yes, so it is. anyway, love you all. See you next time. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This has been Kaylee here in the studio with us and Brandon has been in the virtual studio. Thank you all for coming. Love you all and I'll see you later. Bye.